Well, good morning, Temple family, and welcome to our guests. We are so glad that you've joined us here today. Uh, Merry Christmas as we begin our, our Christmas season here together. As is our tradition um, in our church, we love to begin our worship services by reading Scripture. Today we're going to be in John chapter 3, or excuse me, John chapter 1, and we're going to be beginning in verse 1. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent by God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of, of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Let's pray together. Thank you, Jesus, so much for uh, your your birth and your entry into our world, and we come together as a church to to celebrate your first advent and and what a difference you have made in in this world and in our personal lives. And we want to give you our best today. We want to glorify you, and we want to glorify the Father. And we pray that the Spirit will speak to us and challenge us and shape us into the image of of you, Lord. Uh, be glorified in everything we do in this service. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Good morning, Temple Baptist Church family. We're so excited that you decided to join us this morning for our online worship service. Um, so as we're worshiping this morning, let's just remember that worship is supposed to be a vertical thing. It isn't about us. It isn't about, you know, the problems that we're dealing with, but it's about glorifying God. So as we worship this morning together, let's keep that in mind and let's really just give our all to Christ. <laughs> You have not let me go too far away Although I've strayed, although I've strayed All I have found is a love that remains A love that remains And all I could see was the mess that I made But you were not phased, no you were not phased and all I have found is a love that remains, a love that remains. When I was in need, you sought after me. When I turned away, your love has never changed. You paid off my debt. Gave me your rest and wash off my weary feet. Prepared a feast, saved me a seat, and brought out your best for me.
Well, good morning, Temple friends and family. Thank you so much, guests as well, for joining us for our digital worship service this morning. I have a couple quick announcements this morning. Uh, the first is for our mock student ministries. Uh, we're going to have mock Christmas starting this Saturday night. That's December the 12th at 6 p.m. We'll hope you'll come out and join us. Uh, we'll be socially distanced. We'll be spread out upstairs uh, by the mock student room. We'll meet in some smaller groups with some more space. Just we want to keep everybody safe. We're going to have plenty of food, some fellowship, uh, some fun games and prizes. And I just can't wait to see you there. So, again, that's mock Christmas this Saturday, December the 12th. We'll conclude uh, the morning of the 13th. And you can sign up now at templechurch.net or in the Church Center app. Also, Saturday night is Joy Jam. This is a parents' night out 
for our Temple kids, kindergarten through fifth grade. You can sign up now. Again, templechurch.net or in the Church Center app. Again, we'll have dinner. That'll be at 6 p.m. Saturday, December the 12th. We can't wait to see you. One other thing I want to remind everybody of is our Christmas Eve service, December the 24th to 6 p.m. Uh, we're going to have our Christmas Eve service. We'll have social distancing over in the sanctuary. Uh, we'll be wearing masks. We just can't wait to see you to worship uh, worship the Lord as we, as we celebrate the coming of a Savior and the gift we are given in Christ. We hope to see you there again. That's Christmas Eve, December 24th at 6 p.m. So that's all I have for announcements. Here at Temple, though, we are working through the New City Catechism. And I would like you guys to join us uh, in that. If you don't have a copy of this book and you'd like a hard copy of the book, reach out to us. You can email us at temple at templechurch.net. You can call the church office. I'd love to make sure you get a copy of this book. And all a catechism is, is it's a question and an answer. And it, it helps you grow to know God, to understand the beliefs. And we just, uh, we hope you'll use this. You can find it also in the app store of any smartphone. You can go to newcitycatechism.net. There are some outstanding resources. So here's how this works. In just a moment, we're going to put this question up on the screen. I'm going to ask you the question, and as a family, we'd like you guys to respond together with that answer. So we're, we're going to go ahead. There's 52 questions and answers in the New City Catechism, and uh, here we are. We are on question 49 this week. We're coming to the end, but again, this is an outstanding resource. Question 49, it's up on the screen for you, is where is Christ now? And that answer. How great it is to know that that as we come to celebrate this Christmas season and the the coming of a Savior, that Jesus didn't just come and live a life. Jesus came, he lived a perfect life, a life we can't live, died a death we deserve, and defeated death at the resurrection. We now know that he's seated at the right hand of God. I can't help but think of this scripture, Ephesians 1, verses 20 and 21. It says, he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. He's the right hand of God. He has power, and he's interceding for us. What great news that is for us. Again, if you don't have this resource, please reach out to us. We'd love for you to have this and use this as a family. I'm going to turn over to Pastor Wes now as he prays over this week's offering. Well, This morning, as we give, um, let's remember a biblical principle And that is that the Bible teaches that Christian giving must be willing and it must be free. Christian giving must be willing and it must be free. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 7 says that each one must give as purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion. Now, of course, when you read that, that makes you wonder, is, is giving just optional then as a Christian? And the answer is, of course, no. A true Christian giving is both mandatory, but it's also voluntary. It's required by God. But God always wants us to be willing in our giving. And he wants us to be willing in whatever amount that we give as well. So in our church, there are three ways that you can give. Number one, you can set up recurring giving at templechurch.net. Number two, you can come by our church and drop off your gift in our drop box. And number three, you can do text to give. Text this number, 84321, and any amount, and that will will, uh, be counted towards your giving here in our church. And let me just ask as an additional consideration this month, think about giving to our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Our goal is $12,000. Five hundred dollars, and uh, we know things are tight, and we know with everything going on with COVID and 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 uh, just our world and the economy, it's a little harder this year to give. Um, but in, in in many ways, that's the that means more because it's more of a sacrifice on our part. But I want you to pray about it. Give as the Lord leads you. It may be just a little bit. It may be that you can give a lot. Uh, we're not all created equally in terms of how much we can give. Um, some of us are really blessed and can give a lot more. And um, if that's you, praise God. But whatever you can give, just give to the Lord and give it gladly, as the Scripture says. Thank you so much for all that you do in our church. Um, for those of you who are watching online and you haven't been to our, our 10 a.m. service, just remember how much um, we love you, we miss you, we're praying for you, we're thinking about you. 
And um, thank you for everything that you do to pray for us and to support our church. And so let's pray together. Lord, we, we give you these gifts today um, as an expression of our, our gratitude to, to you for all that you have given to us. You have been kind to us. You have helped our church through a very difficult season, and I know that you're going to continue to be faithful. So today we, we bring our, our tithes and our offerings to you, and we pray that you bless these gifts and you use them to, to do great things in, in, in this church and beyond. May your kingdom grow through our faithfulness, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it's hard to believe that December is already here and we're focusing on Jesus' first advent. That is his first coming when he was born as a baby in Bethlehem. And today, as we think about Christmas, we're going to go back to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 9. And we're going to look at a, po- a, a passage, really a, a prophecy that begins back in chapter 7 all the way through Isaiah chapter 9 um, about the coming of the Messiah. And biblical prophecy is a genre that can be challenging uh, challenging to understand and, and interpret. Uh, the symbols, the, the language used, it can all be a bit confusing. And you add to this the fact that uh, often with, with prophecy, there's an immediate context for the prophecy given, but also a future fulfillment. And then there's the questions of timing. Why does God do things like this? Why does he, uh, why does he make us wait? Uh, you know, how do we figure out his timing? These are all questions that we have. So as we look at this passage in Isaiah, here's a little context. The events of this passage happened 700 years before the birth of Jesus. And the prophet is Isaiah. He prophesied before King Ahaz. Um, now there's an immediate context for some of what Ahaz, uh, Isaiah says here to the king. Most scholars believe that there was a child that was born in that era, a sign child, a promise that that he would give the king victory over, over his enemies. But the prophecy of Isaiah also had ultimate fulfillment. As you read the description of this child, there's no way any child in King Ahaz's day, or before or after, could accomplish such things. Isaiah's words ultimately spoke of the coming Messiah, and God would wait 700 years before he sent Jesus. So let's take a few moments this morning and unpack these verses and see what kind of Messiah God had planned to send to our world. The first thing we see in our text is that God brings light in the darkness. Chapter 8 ends, if you, if you kind of go back and look, it ends in distress, it ends in darkness, gloom, and anguish. People uh, go through judgment because of their idolatry. Um, they sought uh, uh, they, they sought mediums, in, in essence, the occult. They, they sought mediums to, to find the, the will of God. And, uh, and at the same time, they rejected the true wisdom of God. And as a result, the Scripture says that the, the people are roaming the earth. They're angry. They're in despair and darkness. They're cursing God and cursing their king. But chapter 9 opens with light. It opens with hope for people who grow up and live in darkness. And so the promises of verses 1 and 2 come to a nation that is under judgment, both the northern and the southern kingdoms of Israel. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish, the Scripture says. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan. Galilee of the nations. So historically speaking, Zebulun and Naphtali are areas known as the, the Galilee of the nations um, in, in the north where we, we first see uh, the tribes of the northern kingdoms of Israel conquered and deported by the Assyrians under the, the leadership of Tiglath-Pileser III around 732 B.C. Um, they were, uh, among the tribes of Israel, they were the first to know slavery deportation and despair well fast forward 700 years guess from what region jesus launches his earthly ministry galilee it is here that jesus does his first miracle the at the the wedding of, of cana in galilee the people of galilee were the first ones to see the light of jesus matthew chapter 4 verses 13 and 16 quotes this very passage in isaiah as fulfillment of what, of, of what God promised through the prophet many years ago. Um, a few verses later in that same chapter, here's what Matthew writes. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. So in God's goodness and grace, he comes to, the people f- f- to his people first where they had suffered 
the most. And from that place, he launched salvation for the world. So that brings us to verse 2 where he says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. With the coming of Jesus, God ushers in a new era of grace. Israel did nothing to accomplish this. They had rejected God. They had cursed God. They had consulted mediums instead of God. But amazingly, God would not let them go. And you know that's true of us as well. We have rejected God. We have cursed God. We have turned to other, other gods and put our trust in them. We have done nothing to earn his favor, and yet he loves us, and he reaches down to us. To them, uh, those people in Isaiah's day, and to us today, God graciously sends his son. But there's a second movement in this passage, and that is that God increases the joy of his people, verses 3 through 5. Look with me again in your Bibles. He says, you have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle, tumult, and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. So in verses 3 through 5 here, God basically says he increases the joy of his people by defeating the oppressor of his people. That's the simple way to understand what he's saying. And the joy that they have here is linked to, to the defeat of Midian, according to verses 4 and 5. Now, now, that name might sound familiar to you because that goes back to the story of Gideon in the book of Judges. Um, just to give you a quick overview of what happens, uh, the Israelites are oppressed by the, the Midianites. They cry out to God for deliverance. God raises up Gideon to be the deliverer of his people. But Gideon has some serious doubts about the assignment that God has given him. So in response to, to God sending him as Israel's deliverer, he says to the Lord, But how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. In other words, imagine your family and the least likely person in your family to be the warrior, to be the, the deliverer. That's who Gideon was. That's who God chose. And if it wasn't intimidating enough... For Gideon, God kept decreasing the number of soldiers that he would have to fight in the battle because God says, you know what, if, if I send you in there with a bunch of soldiers, all you're going to do is brag when, when the victory is yours. You're going to go, look what we did. And God says, no, nope, I want you to see that it's my hand that delivers you. And so by the time the battle actually be began, it was very clear that the Lord fought for Israel without even a sword in Gideon's hand, without a sword in his hand, God defeated the Midianites. And so God caused the Midianite camp to turn on itself, destroying each other in the darkness of night. And as a result, their oppressors were defeated. But as Isaiah looks forward to the coming Messiah, he says that Jesus will defeat the enemy of God's people. Well, who would that be? Well, it would have to be Satan. Satan is our oldest and most formidable enemy, the Bible says. He is the enemy that has used sin to enslave us and the fear of death to overwhelm us. But through Jesus' own death and resurrection, Jesus destroys the power of sin, and death loses its, its, its sting, and the Scripture says Satan is defeated. But there's more good news about this Messiah that God is going to send, and that is that God sends a Savior. He's very specific. God will not leave his people to be in despair and ruin. God has an answer for the people that have been walking in darkness, and it is, amazingly, the birth of a child. Right? It's not a it's not more weapons. It's not a, it's not a, graver, a greater military. Uh, it, it's, it's not some, something new, something amazing that would give them some type of military advantage. No, it's, a, it's the birth of a child, but not just any child. This will be the most unique child in history. He will be both human and divine. 100% man, 100% God. God's answer, in fact, is so unlikely, so unexpected, unexpected that it becomes a stumbling block for the Jews. I mean, how can God be both human and divine? Uh, that, that made no sense to the Jews. And indeed, there's a great mystery to the incarnation. J.I. Packer, one of the greatest theologians of our era, wrote about this mystery in his classic work, Knowing God. In it, he writes, 
the supreme mystery with which the gospel confronts us is in the Christmas message of incarnation. The really staggering Christian claim is that Jesus of Nazareth was God made man, that the second person of the Godhead became the second man, determining human destiny, the second representative, head of the race, and that he took humanity without loss of deity, so that Jesus of Nazareth was truly and fully divine as he was human. Here are two mysteries for the price of one, the plurality of persons within the unity of God and the union of Godhead Godhead and manhood in the person of Jesus. It is here, in the thing that happened at the first Christmas, that the profoundest and most unfathomable depths of Christian revelation lie. Quote, the word became flesh. God became man. The divine son became a Jew. The Almighty appeared on earth as a helpless human baby, unable to do more than lie and stare and wriggle and make noises, needing to be fed and changed and talk and taught to talk like any other child. Wow, he puts it really well. When you think about it in those terms, it is truly amazing and mysterious how, how God accomplishes this. So what do we specifically learn about this child, this, this coming child? Well, first of all, we learn that he is a gift for us. Twice in verse 6 we see this. It says, for to us a child is born. To us a son is given. So Jesus is, a, is given to benefit us, to help us. He is for our greatest good. Secondly, we learn that this child has authority. The text goes on to say that the government shall be upon his shoulder. You know, sometimes when we walk into uh, a situation that seems chaotic, we ask, you know, who's in charge here? Um, and because everything just seems so crazy. Well, I think that describes the world. The world at times feels chaotic and despotic, fractured and corrupt. But when King Jesus steps onto the scene, there will be no question about who is in charge. He'll be running the world with perfect righteousness and justice. He is the answer that the world has for a, a, a perfect leader and a perfect government. The third thing we learn about though the coming child is that the coming Messiah will have the perfect resume. Uh, there's a fourfold description of the Messiah here in verse 6 that kind of showcases, in, at least in part, his humanity and his deity. First, we see that he is wonderful counselor. This speaks to the wisdom of the Messiah. Uh, the scriptures say that as a boy, Jesus grew in, in wisdom and favor with man. In fact, the, the wisdom of Jesus was so evident in his earthly ministry that when he taught in the synagogues, the people asked, where did he receive such wisdom and, and such power to perform miracles. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, Jesus is described as, he's described as wis the wisdom of God and the wisdom from God. And finally, in Colossians 2, Jesus is described this way, in whom all hidden are the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So this morning, do you need wise counsel? Do you want to live your life with the least amount of regrets? Do you want to know the right path that you ought to take in your life? Well, then, know Jesus, for in him you will know wisdom. The second thing, though, we, we learn about this child is that he is mighty God. And this speaks to, I think, the divine nature of the Messiah. So he is mighty like a great warrior, but he's also divine. He defeats his, enemy, uh, his enemies. And so if, if he is for us, who can be against us? But Isaiah has more to say. He says also that he is everlasting father. You know, father is a, a human word that we can all relate to. But when you put that word everlasting or internal in front of it, we get a picture that something supernatural is going on here, that this is a father without beginning or without end. He's a father that loves us and watches over us. He gives good gifts to his children. He will never leave us and never forsake us. Well, finally, he gives one more description, and that is that he is Prince of Peace. Throughout history, great kingdoms have risen and fallen. All have promised prosperity and peace. Some have delivered on this for a season, but in time, all failed, and eventually all kingdoms of this world will fail. But notice verse 7 with me. It says, of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom. So as King Jesus, 
He will establish his kingdom with unending and ever-increasing peace and prosperity. Now, you might think, hold on, I, I, I've got some questions here because there's a disconnect, I think, for a lot of people at this point when we talk about the Messiah. I mean, if Jesus is the Messiah, then why, why haven't we seen these things happen? And especially among Jewish people, um, this is a real stumbling block even to this day. Uh, I've, I've read many articles about this. I've had conversations with Jewish people. And so the, 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 the question kind of goes like this. If Jesus is the Messiah, where's your proof? Because if Jesus is the promise of Messiah, then where's the worldwide shalom that, he, that the Messiah is supposed to bring? You know, the wolf that lies down with the lamb, uh, the peace between nations, the wholeness of life experience. And I think, frankly, these are good questions. But I think what's not understood is that Jesus has, according to the Scriptures, two Advents. Right? So the first we celebrate at Christmas with his birth. The second Advent, or his second coming, is what we watch for and wait for and long for. And so in his first Advent, Jesus comes to deal with our greatest need. He doesn't come to establish world peace. No, he comes to deal with our greatest need, which is that we are sinners. He comes to atone for our sins so that we can be reconciled to the Father. In his second advent, though, he will deal with suffering. He will make all things new. He will vanquish evil forever. He will, he will make the, the, the world and everything that exists peaceful and full of God's shalom. Now, you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, why doesn't God do all this at the same time? It, it, to me, that seems logical. If you've got too big a, things to get done, do them all at once and get it out of the way. That's how we think. And, and I think the disciples had similar questions as well. You know, it, are you going to restore the, the nation at this time? That's their question before he ascends into heaven. But I think the, the, the question, or the answer rather, to that question is simply that God just has his own timing. He has a timing for everything he does. The scripture says, at the right time, God sent his son into the world to be, bo be born of a woman. Uh, Jesus, again, right before he goes to back to heaven to be with the Father, he says to his disciples, it's not for us to know the times and the seasons that God has set by his own authority. In other words, God has a timing for what he does. Now, if you're like me, you hate to wait for, for good things. Uh, I ordered something the other day. Uh, and, uh, you know, for, first of all, for me, two-day shipping is, is too slow. I want it right now. That's just kind of me. So I ordered something the other day. didn't order it from Amazon, where I usually order from and get my two-day shipping. Uh, I had to order it from another company, and it took forever. And I kept going back every day and checking my tracking number and then refreshing the page to see, is it getting closer? Is it ever going to get here? See, I absolutely hate to wait. But sometimes... Waiting is necessary, uh, even if you don't like it or if it doesn't make sense to you. Think for, with me for just a moment. How many good things in life take time? Um, so, for example, it takes time to have a baby. It takes time to plan a wedding. It takes time to make really good pot roast. It takes time to fall in love. So many good things rightly take time. If you force them, if you do them early or quickly, you do damage to them. So why is there so much time between Jesus' first advent and Jesus' second advent? Well, God waits because of his wisdom, because God alone knows the right time. Now, let me point out a couple more things, and then we'll be done. In, in look again at verse 7, because it tells us something very important about, about this coming messianic kingdom and the government that Christ will have, it says, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Think about that for a moment. Peace and goodness in the coming kingdom will never be interrupted by evil, and things are just going to continually get better and better. You know, so many people think that heaven's going to just be this, this, this really boring place, and honestly, they are just so wrong. Um, we will never stop learning about God. We will never stop loving Him. He will always be revealing more of Himself and more of His plans for all eternity. And so again, Jesus is the answer. He's the longing of the human heart for that perfect leader and that perfect lasting uh, government. And, and Jesus, by the way, will be a very different kind of leader, or you might say king. At the end of verse 7, here's what it says. It says, He, he will be to establish and uphold it with justice, and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. You know, in Israel's histories, there, there, history, there were times when 
they did have godly kings, especially in the southern kingdom versus the northern kingdom. Um, and so at times they, they had godly kings who reigned and peace filled the land. But in every situation, these were always short-lived, often due, due to foreign oppression or the sins of Israel and its leaders. I mean, even David, whose, whose throne here is mentioned in the verse, he failed to be the kind of king that God desired him to be. Though Jesus is a human king, he will not be corruptible like the kings of the earth. Jesus will never be cruel. He will never take bribes. His decisions will be always just, and he will always be righteousness. But, but looking at all of that, what does Jesus do for us first? How does he first make peace? Because now we're talking about ultimate peace. Let's back up just for a moment to his first advent. How does Jesus make peace primarily for us in his first advent? Well, he does it through his death on the cross. While we are still sinners, alienated, enemies of God, Jesus dies for us, and through his death, he establishes eternal peace for us. Well, let me add one more thing, and we'll be done. Number four, God's passion for, the, for us is the impetus for the Messiah. God's passion for us is the impetus for the Messiah. At the end of verse 7, there's a sentence I think that's just so easy to, to miss. It says, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do, do this. God's zeal, God's, God's passion will accomplish all the goodness that Isaiah is describing in this pas passage for us. It is the passion uh, for the Messiah and it is the passion that God has for his people that accomplishes everything that is good for us in our history and in our future. And what a picture, again, brothers and sisters, this is, I think, of grace. You know, one writer refers to this passage as, quote, the triumph of grace over our failure. That's it. That is it. God's zeal is what makes the difference in our lives. He is passionate about our future victory. God does everything. And that's great news for us because, frankly, we never truly worship God with any consistency. You know, we, we look back in our Bibles and Israel's history and we wonder, how could they ever doubt God after all the miracles he's done? Or how could they continuously rebel against him and, and run after idols? Or how could they turn away from him after he had blessed them in so many ways? But then all we have to do is look in, in the mirror, and we can answer that question because we've done it ourselves. You know, our heart is often divided, but God's never is. His love for us is constant and it's enduring. His people failed him in the Old Testament. They cursed him. They deserted him but he never gave up on them. And brothers and sisters, remember this today. He will never give up on you. The guarantee of your future salvation is not your own hard work. It's not your own inherent goodness. It is the love and the zeal of the Lord of hosts. What a God we serve. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for your love and your passion because if, if it was left up to us, we would, never, we would never, ever reach you. We would never be made right with you. We would never see the Messiah. We would, we would wander away from you and uh, continue to rebel against you. But you have been gracious to us. You have reached out and loved us in spite of our sins. You've given us uh, a new nature and, and, and indwelled us with your spirit. You've given us new desires, new passions for life, a, a new perspective for for our, how we live. We thank you for all these gifts. They come from your hands. So God, may we, may we look at the gifts you've given us and not take them for granted, but see them as stewardships to give you our very best in return. We thank you for Jesus and for his coming and what he accomplished in his first advent, but Lord, we look forward to his second advent when he will make all things new and we will experience the fullness of all that has been promised to us in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. God bless you. Hey, Temple Friends, family, guests, uh, thank you for joining us today. We really hope you enjoyed it. A uh, reminder, we do have our mock student ministries, our mock Christmas, as well as the Joy Jam coming up this Saturday. Also want to make everybody aware of that Christmas Eve service. We love you. We miss you. We, we just want to say thank you again for joining us in this online service. Uh, if there's any prayer requests, please reach out to us, temple at templechurch.net, any way that we can help you this holiday season. Uh, again, we love you. We miss you. God bless you. Have a great week.